On behalf of VIA Franchise Consulting, I would like to welcome you all today to our webinar, Why You Need to Consider Education Franchises, hosted by VF Franchise Consulting. In case you missed it earlier, my name is Sean No, and I will be the MC for today. Just a few things to um, remember before we get started. Uh, briefly, I would like to spend a few minutes uh, to introduce VF Franchise Consulting. We will also have a question and answer session after the presenter has presented. Due to the large number of participants, uh, I believe we have over 300 registrations as of this morning. Please type your questions into your device as your microphone has been turned off automatically. You can enter your questions at any time by entering your questions in the text box at the right of, at the right of your screen. Please end your questions with a question mark and it will automatically appear in the list of questions for the speaker to select and to answer. After the presentation and the Q&A, we will follow up with you in the next few days via email with more information regarding this topic, including a recording of this particular webinar. So please keep a lookout for our email. And now I would like to spend just a few minutes talking briefly about VF Franchise Consulting. As you can see, we have headquarters uh, in Vietnam. Our headquarters is based in Ho Chi Minh City. This is where the bulk of our team is based. Uh, we also have a Singapore branch, uh, which is managed by our partner in Singapore. We have been doing franchise consulting for nearly 15 years in Asia and more. Uh, outside of Asia, uh, we are, our vision is to be the leading and most trusted go-to franchise uh, consultancy in Asia, uh, not just Southeast Asia, but uh, uh, the, the, grand, uh, the grand picture, the big picture of uh, overall Asia. We select a few select concepts that are highly adaptable that we feel personally will be successful uh, in this region. Uh, and we believe that all of our clients have uh, proven success, have high potential growth, and have uh, advantages that are sustainable. What makes us a little bit unique is our team is based uh, is based uh, and, and, and relies on not only management consultants, uh, but finance experts, marketing experts, and franchise operations and development experts as well. So we are uh, a little unique in the fact that when we represent our clients, we organize a lot of business matching events that you see throughout Asia. And of course, uh, during these times, we have... Um, uh, incorporated many, many different types of webinars uh, in order to uh, work around the current situation and environment. Here is a brief of all the brands that we are currently offering in Asia. Uh, as you can see, they cover uh, education, uh, F&B, uh, as well as retail and services. A brief about myself, uh, I am Vietnamese American. I have been based in Asia for over 15 years. Prior to my life uh, in franchising, I worked in finance and marketing uh, at various uh, Fortune 500 companies in America. Some of them you will be familiar with, um, including companies like Microsoft. Uh, I was also involved in helping to bring the first American burger chain to Vietnam many years ago. Uh, and that was uh, how we got started into franchising and franchise consultancies. The services that we offer primarily to many clients include helping them to find qualified franchisees uh, and investors uh, throughout Asia. We are a little bit different than other consultants uh, in the fact that when we go from country to country, we are looking for multi-unit franchisees. Uh, sometimes we call them area franchisees, uh, and sometimes we call them master franchisees. Uh, it just depends on whether uh, you as the franchisee are allowed to sub-franchise. 
We also assist uh, quite a few companies throughout Asia in terms of making their business franchisable should they wish to look at uh, an additional uh, new business uh, based on their proven success of their current business. Uh, so we have many projects ongoing related to that. And of course, we do many other things in terms of operations, uh, in terms of feasibility studies, uh, in terms of doing operations, audits, manuals, et cetera. In addition, some of our clients are not specifically interested in expanding via franchising. Some of them are interested in uh, finding distribution partners and jo joint venture uh, partners. So we provide those services uh, as well. And then there are other ad hoc services, uh, project-based. Many of them are short-term projects. Uh, they include various types of project management, uh, marketing uh, strategies, uh, new store build-outs, mystery shopper programs, uh, operational audits, uh, et cetera. Okay, so with that, I would like now to introduce you to our guest speaker, Mr. Robert Bolsolet. He is uh, the VIA Franchise Development and Operations Director Mr. Robert has extensive franchise experience, including experience in the English learning education sector. And I know that he will uh, review that with you. With that, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Robert. So thank you very much, Sean, for the company introduction and the introduction for myself. Um, I'm happy to be here this afternoon or whatever time it happens to be for all our attendees. I'm glad you could make it. As Sean mentioned, uh, my name is Robert. I do work for VIA Franchise Consulting. Uh, I do have a lot of experience uh, in education and also in food and beverage, and also, of course, in franchising. I don't want to spend a lot of time in myself, um, but I am Canadian, but I've lived in uh, Asia for uh, 12 years now in multiple countries. So I do at least understand this area reasonably well. So you're all here to uh, listen to our topic about uh, why you should consider an education franchise. So we're gonna consider the advantages and the challenges of the education franchise industry. And here are some of the questions that we're going to attempt to answer. Uh, what are education franchise? What do we really mean when we, when we use this term? We're going to do some comparisons with how they compare with other franchise industries. Of course, answer our question about why you should consider an education franchise. Also, what you should look for once you decide you're interested in an education franchise. And what opportunities exist in Asia in this very exciting industry. So, education franchising, we're going to define it. We're also uh, going to talk about the demand in ASEAN specifically for education franchising. And we're going to do this in a little bit of a unique way today, just to look at things from a different angle to keep it interesting. We're going to look at this industry by comparing education franchising to the number one most popular franchise category which is food and beverage. So by going through the typical franchise package and the support that you can expect to receive from a franchisor, as well as some of the industry challenges to compare the two. So I hope that uh, you'll enjoy the topic and I hope that we can answer all of our questions today. So we will uh, touch a little bit about the finances and also some of the brands that are available uh, in the region. So what are the types of education franchises? So likely the first thing that comes to your mind is English centers. And that's true. It actually is the largest segment of the educational franchise industry. Uh, but we also have other languages, specifically Mandarin, because of the large Chinese influence in the last 10 years or so. 
that is expected to only grow over time. There is kindergartens, which is a relatively new type of franchise in, in the industry. You have technical or skill training. So uh, teaching people to be bakers or chefs, um, music, teaching music or math, Microsoft programs, Microsoft Office, um, Windows, emails, uh, other computer programming skills. You have things like corporate skills training, so soft skills or, or management skills. You even have uh, STEM-based skills uh, in the science, technology, engineering, and math uh, industry. There's also some private tutoring franchises, uh, that, although that's more common in the West. Now, one of the first questions that people ask, is there really a demand? So before we get into the business itself in detail, I wanted to talk a little bit about the growth of private education uh, in Asia. So if you're, whether you're a franchisor or whether you're a potential franchisee in this region, you can see that the market is very attractive for international education franchising. Currently, Southeast Asia alone is a $60 billion uh, per year industry that continues to grow every single year. And if you uh, group it together with for all of Asia, you see it's a $350 billion uh, industry if we include South Asia and the Asia Pacific. So the market is there. It continues to grow every single year which is exciting. Um, and a recent survey that I read indicated that there are more than 1.4 billion English language learners out there. And that's only just one type of education franchise. So there's definitely a huge worldwide potential in this industry, and Asia is a big part of that demand. Now you might ask me, so, so why does this demand exist and why specifically this growth and this demand in the Asian market? Well, we can see here six uh, key demand drivers. First is a shrinking household size. So especially in uh, developing markets, Vietnam and Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, and other countries similar to those, as the country develops as incomes rise, then households naturally shrink. So that leaves uh, more money to spend on each uh, individual in that household, mostly focused on the children. There's a lot of rapid urbanization in the region. So more and more people are moving to the larger cities. And of course, in larger cities, uh, there is a high demand for additional skills, whether it's English, whether it's higher math skills, uh, whether it's better education, uh, soft skills and communication, or Microsoft Office skills, all of these types of skills, of course, are in much higher demand. The expectations are much higher in the urban centers. Currently, education is fairly affordable in the region. So unlike uh, developed countries in the UK or the US where education of any sort is a very premium priced, in Asia, it's still reasonably uh, affordable for a large segment of the population. And there's also a low, ca uh, low capacity versus the demand. So if you look at that demand that we were talking about several moments ago, and you look at the capacity of uh, education centers in your area, you can see that there's a much higher de um, demand than there is the capacity to fulfill that demand. So almost in every single market across the region, there is massive room for growth uh, in the educational franchising industry. There's also a, a value of English proficiency. So most of us are familiar with that. That's nothing new or uh, ex nothing new anyways for probably anyone on this call. But if you look at any of the franchising, uh, educational franchises, 
they all tend to have an English component to them, even if they're not English language centers. An international kindergarten is going to have a, a premium English program automatically included. Uh, often some of the other educational franchising also is done uh, in English or has an English element. So that comes through across the entire industry. And it's very important for Asia particularly to continue to in, improve on the value, uh, on the ability of their English language skills. And then there's a desire for international education. You know, if you're in the UK or and you have a kindergarten or a math program that's from the UK or from the US or Europe, it's just considered normal, isn't it? But if you're in a country like Thailand, for example, and you look at a UK-based franchise that might be open in your area, there's definitely an elevated perception. There's a, a greater perceived value of international anything virtually in the Asia market. So when they see international education, it automatically gives it an edge compared to local um, educational institutions. So that's the demand in the, in the region. For a second, I'm gonna talk about the most popular type of franchising. So according to entrepreneur.com, which, which does this every single year and looks at the top 500 franchises, almost 60% are in the F&B industry. Uh, six out of, sorry, six out of the top 10 and, and about 50% of the entire list. So when you think of franchising, likely the first thing that comes to your mind is brands such as McDonald's or Pizza Hut, Subway, and of course, they're all in the F&B industry. Now, education is a huge uh, portion of this top 500, about 8% are in education, so it makes it one of the top five categories. So while our purpose today is to evaluate education franchising, we want to compare it to our number one category. And there's a reason that food and beverage is number one. <clears throat> it can be profitable, it's interesting, there's always a high demand. So we're in no way saying anything negative about restaurants or food franchising. But I really wanted to open people's minds today to, to other opportunities, that restaurants are not the only type of franchises available. They're for sure not the easiest to operate. And education has uh, quite a number of advantages, which I hope that we'll be able to highlight during uh, the next few minutes. <clears throat> So we're going to do this by looking at uh, the different elements of uh, a brand. So the typical support from a franchisor, according to the IFA or the International Franchise Association, and the really the elements and the reason why people want to franchise. They want to take advantage of things like the experience of a franchisor, the training the franchisor is going to provide the purchasing and marketing support, uh, ongoing advice, operational advice, uh, research and development for new products, and also the business synergy or the network of the franchise of that particular brand. So going through them one by one, if we look at that first one, franchise or support. So we're looking at the experience of the franchise or. So when you buy a franchise, you're purchasing the proven operating system and the experience of that people in, the, in that brand. And that should give you a reduction of time, uh, less trial and error in your startup. And you should be able to be successful with less industry knowledge, not no industry knowledge, but less. And there's an interesting expression by one franchisee, who said, what I have learned from the franchisor was worth 10 times what I paid for the franchise. And that's really what we want every single franchisee to feel like, and they should when they pick the right franchise brand. But looking at that franchisor support, in the food and beverage uh, industry, they do have proven system and experience. 
They can be successful with some industry knowledge, but they have a few challenges in the fact that taste buds and dining habits vary significantly. So something that in, in the US that works very well may not necessarily work in Asia or even countries within Asia, Japan to Korea, Thailand to Vietnam. There's often significant localization that needs to be done menu offerings, flavors, portion sizes. Even in well-known brands like McDonald's, you say, okay, McDonald's is the same everywhere. Well, you know, here in Vietnam, they added breakfast when they first launched. They later removed breakfast completely. They added back half the breakfast menu a little bit later. They added rice dishes. They expanded the pork dishes. So they really went through two full years of menu changes before they were happy, before they got it right for this market. So what about the education industry? Well, obviously education is less influenced by people's personal tastes. English is English, math is math, science is science. So you can be successful with only a general business ability while there is some differences country to country, it's usually very minor things like uh, common speaking errors in English language, for example, or business etiquette. But these are only very, very minor adjustments that need to be considered when you take an educational franchise. So as opposed to a 50 or 75% transfer of system, uh, in a food and beverage concept, you, you can almost get 100%. So I say 90 plus percent transfer of system. You may have to change the size of a classroom. You may have to translate a few things, but the books, the apps, the lesson plans, uh, all of these things are consistent uh, across a brand worldwide. Now, what about training? So again, if any good franchisor, should provide training for the new franchisees. Uh, that can be both uh, at a, a one of their existing locations somewhere, or it can be on-site or both. And really the training should prepare new owners for all areas of the business. You really should be almost purchasing a business in a box when you buy a, a new franchise. And that's what people expect, and that's what franchisors are supposed to provide. So if we look at the two industries again, in food and beverage, often extensive training is necessary. And of course the franchisors provide it, but oftentimes it needs to be a fairly long duration, which can be costly, especially if your team is traveling to the US or to Europe somewhere. There's often multiple positions that need to be trained, the front of house, the kitchen, um, marketing in food and beverage is very unique, so often the marketing requires training. And there tends to be a very high risk if these individuals that you've trained later leave the company. What about education? Well, normally in education, there's only two positions that need to be trained. That's you or a franchisee or the general manager or operations manager. So someone to actually run the business. And then the teachers. So there's only two positions. And often that training can be a fairly short duration uh, at, at quite a limited cost. So there's really an easier um, training uh, segment uh, for any new education franchise. And also in the future, if you do happen to lose some of the individuals who were trained, there's an easier time to transfer uh, to new employees as you have turnover. It's, it's not quite so complex as the food and beverage industry is. Now, what about franchise or support? So there are other departments like purchasing and marketing. Uh, of course, you're expecting files, logos, previous advertisements, and ongoing marketing help. So this is a, an important part of any new franchise. So in the food and beverage industry, you do obviously get some advantages. The problem here 
is that ingredients are typically locally sourced. So a lot of this work still has to be done. Uh, the menu still has to be adjusted as you change exact plating or portion size or specific ingredients. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, even when you're talking about the photos and the marketing materials that are provided from a franchisor, you may have to retake all those photos. You may have to redesign the menu. Where in the education industry, printed materials can be ordered in bulk and distributed easily to franchisees in many countries. So you can take uh, full advantage of the purchasing power of a franchisor. And you're really transferring knowledge, not so much a physical product. So it's highly digital. So it's quicker, it's less expensive, it's generally easier to transfer the system and the marketing materials from the franchisor to the franchisee. And often the only thing that needs to be done is, is some local translation. So again, several advantages in the education industry. Now, if number four is ongoing advice or operations research and development. Of course, we expect all of these things, the other ways that a franchisor will support and everything from location design to how to choose the right location, really how to conduct the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And you do expect new research and development to bring out new products, virtually regardless of the industry that you're doing business in. So this is very important in the restaurant business. Um, usually the franchisors will provide you a great ops manual, good ongoing advice, uh, research and development will bring you new recipes. But again, often there's significant work before those things can be used or launched in a local market. All of the stuff that we've talked about uh, briefly just in the last few minutes, like ingredients, uh, local tastes, presentation styles and marketing materials, photo shoots, all of those things still require a lot of work, even as a franchisee. In the education, these materials and this advice can be transferred directly and used. There's less variation uh, of the students from country to country. Any new products almost are almost always suitable for virtually every single market. So again, math is math, English is English, a chocolate cake is a chocolate cake. So anything that you're doing and learning uh, you can implement it, whether uh, our listeners today are from the Philippines or Vietnam, Japan, doesn't really matter. And the last thing that you get to take advantage of really is the business synergy and the network. So this synergy kind of refers to the idea that the sum of the whole is greater than the individual parts. When you become a franchisee, you become you know, part of the family where all the members can work together for the good of the whole. You get to learn things like best practices and the do's and the don'ts um, from the other franchisees. You also get that brand recognition that can impact your initial uh, market launch of this brand in, in your particular market. And really this is equally important and possible in both industries. So we're not gonna spend uh, too much time on that. So to summarize, you have a less need for localization to be attractive in the market in education franchising. It is easier to transfer uh, both information and training, which uh, results in less costs and a faster startup. There's less risk of your IP being taken and copied. Uh, restaurants are very famous for someone else copying your recipe for stealing your chef and then hiring them and opening up a duplicate concept that's very similar. That's much more difficult to do in the education industry. It's easier to recover when key staff leave. So your education uh, franchises are typically not dependent on any one or two key individual employees. Best practices from your local, uh, from your fellow franchisees are much easier easier to implement in your local market. 
they uh, just make more sense. Something that works uh, in Japan often will still work in Korea or Cambodia or Myanmar. It doesn't really matter uh, where you are. Now that's not 100%, of course, but it is a, a very high percentage. And as a franchisee, there isn't a need for industry-specific skill or experience to the same level that the food and beverage industry is. So whether you're a new investor, uh, education is one of the best industries to look for in a franchise. If you have an education brand, which I know some of you uh, do, now is a good time uh, to get our help to turn uh, it into a franchise and expand it across your home country or internationally. And this is one of the many services that VF Franchise Consulting does on a regular basis. So please contact us if, you're, if that applies to you and you're interested. One last main advantage that we didn't cover is the personal and, and professional satisfaction of being in an industry that has the potential to have such a positive social impact on people. You know, when, they, when we educate them better, especially when we're going from uh, an international brand into a third world country or developing country, helping the people to be better qualified for work and life uh, is obviously has some personal uh, satisfaction to it. So we talked about the advantages. Now let's talk about the challenges of a new franchise, Sp specifically in education. Now, most of these are the challenges are very general. They're the same challenges for any new franchisee. They're slightly different, different um, to the challenges of just a normal business. So you can see again, using uh, the International Franchise Association list, IFA, they list five. Working within the system. So as an entrepreneur, you may be used to doing it the way you want to do it. Not working uh, within somebody else's system. You're not really an employee, but you're not really you're the boss who can make 100% of all of the decisions either. There's risk. And of course, there's risk in any new venture. This is uh, part of uh, just part of the business. But is there ways that we can control this risk? And what are the specific risks to franchising uh, and education franchising directly? There's challenges working with the franchisor. You may not always see exactly eye to eye on every single detail as the franchisor. So keeping a good relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor, keeping open those lines of communication, can sometimes be a challenge. False expectations. You know, some people think that this has been successful in a thousand other, you know, locations in 30 countries. That means I'm going to open and instantly it's going to be a hit. So sometimes uh, as a new, as a business person, we tend to expect a little bit too much, or we think that it's going to be a little easier then it's going to. So that can be a challenge. And lastly, managing the business. Just because you purchased a, a franchise um, or your franchisor and you provided everything that's needed, it doesn't mean that the franchisee doesn't have a lot of work to do. So a lot of these challenges are virtually the same for every new enterprise or business. And, and a lot of and every franchise, whether it's food and beverage or education or some other division. But let's just discuss a couple of them. So we're going to talk about the risks and we're also going to talk about managing the business. So let's look at challenge number two, which was the risk. You know, of course, with any business, uh, there is a risk. And one of the things that some people forget is that the franchisee does own the business. And he or she, to a great extent, is going to determine the success of that business. The franchisors and the ones that we're going to show you later, they have great programs. They have well-respected names. But in the end, a lot of the success or failure of the business is going to be 
in the franchisee's hands. So some four specific risks in education franchising are picking the right brand partner, knowing your market and your competitors, hiring the right team, especially at the beginning, and choosing the right locations. Again, especially and particularly the very first one. So number one, picking the right brand partner. And this is where we can really help. VF Franchise Consulting, you know, we sort through hundreds and thousands of available franchises, and we only choose to represent ones that we feel have a high potential for success in our markets. So I will introduce some to you shortly at the end of this presentation. And, and you can be rest assured that all of those brands have high potential to be successful throughout Asia. Now, knowing your market and your competitors, you know, many people think that obviously they know their home market, but that doesn't mean they know it for doing business or that they know it well for the education industry. And we don't wanna skip this step because it's important. So if you don't feel qualified to, to do some research and market study, uh, again, we can help you with that. But it's very key to making the right decisions, especially at the beginning. So it's a, it's a step that you really don't want to skip, whether you do it yourself or you hire somebody else to really do a, a proper evaluation. Now, hiring the right team. You know, any business has success or failure based on their team. And one of the strengths in franchising is that the franchisor can tell you exactly who you need to hire. They also provide the initial training for both yourself and your staff. So one thing that you can do to mitigate the risk is ask a lot of questions of the franchisor or the franchising consultant. You know, what training is included? Um, what, uh, how is it done? Is there any costs involved? How long does it take? What positions you train? And also you can do a lot of things by putting together a, a good corporate culture from the very beginning is often uh, overlooked, especially because you're so busy doing many things. But this is one thing that you shouldn't overlook when employees feel like they're joining a respected brand, but also a company that's going to take good care of them. They tend to work harder, they stay longer, uh, and that will make your job a lot easier. So the last one, you've probably heard the expression before, location, location, location. Almost doesn't matter what business you're in, it's always important. But that doesn't mean that you're looking for the most expensive or the most visible spot available. You know, there's many things that come into play when making this decision. It has to work uh, well with your unit level financials, your profit and loss. It has to showcase the brand. It really has to set the standard for the brand, especially that first location. It has to be easily accessible to the public. And it has to be visible because you're introducing something new to the market. So balancing all of this is not easy. But actually, if you've done the first three very well, uh, picking the right partner, doing the right market entry study, hiring the right team, uh, number four actually is usually a little bit easier. Now, challenge number five, managing the business. You know, some people are, are very skilled at managing a business. They've, they've done it many times uh, across many different industries. So they have that experience. They also know how to, well, how, how to get along very well with other people, be it the, their staff, be it the franchise or partner. Now, other people may have a little bit less experience. So we want to make sure that we're honest with ourselves. Look at yourself and assess your ability to run a business. And then if you're lacking in certain areas, we wanna make sure that we get help from our franchisor, especially in those areas, or hire additional uh, staff with the skills that we lack. 
For educational franchising, uh, I've kind of broken it down into four uh, areas of managing the business, day-to-day -day operations, marketing, sales and student recruitment, and then HR. So day-to-day -day operations, this is basically the daily tasks that are required to run an educational franchise. And franchisors can usually let you know what you as a franchisee should be doing on a daily basis. The nice thing about education franchising, it's not usually that uh, burdensome. Of course, you're busy. There's a lot of things to do. Uh, it can be challenging, but it is less difficult than many other sectors. Now, speaking about marketing, sales, and recruitment, you know, the market in ASEAN particularly has such a huge demand for education that, that we mentioned earlier, and they are willing to pay for it especially for young learners, for children. So that doesn't mean that they will choose your brand for that training. So marketing and sales should be the main focus of your office team. And franchisors should be giving you the tools that you need to accomplish this, as well as suggestions uh, that have been successful in other markets that you can uh, try. And this is where an international franchise that has uh, multiple outlets in multiple countries can really be a huge advantage. And finally, HR. So ask any owner or GM in almost any industry, and they're likely going to tell you that HR is the headache. So things like that keeping your employees motivated, Reducing employee turnover, uh, training, retraining, managing, keeping up performance is always going to be a constant challenge. Now, this can be overcome by having good corporate policies, by having clear regulations and task assignments, uh, getting good training. And of course, this is a, another place that we get uh, good advantage from international. Uh, education franchises is that you have a partner, you have a, a franchisor that can work together with you uh, who already has many of those systems and can provide a lot of valuable uh, support for you. And we're going to sidestep a minute um, and discuss finance as I, as I listed earlier. You know, every market and every brand is different, but I wanted to share some general numbers uh, typically in brands uh, that we represent or have represented in the past uh, through our other experiences in the industry, we've kind of put together some general terms. So in the restaurant business, uh, return on investment of between two and four years is fairly standard. And that's uh, normally considered acceptable or desirable. So on a unit level, the EBITDA, the net profit that you get out of a unit falls somewhere between 15 and 25%. Talking about investment or your CapEx, usually a single unit at a restaurant, they can vary dramatically. You can open units around 150,000 US dollars or even less sometimes, and they can go as high as one and a half million, two million, even three million for one single restaurant, depending on the brand and the location. Now, comparing that with the education franchising business, the typical return on investment, uh, sometimes it's as fast as one year. And two years seems to be about the average. So you can see it's about half the time. So your EBITDA, your net profit on a unit level, falls somewhere between 20 and 60%. So we see that in general, it's, it's simply a, a more profitable industry to be in. The investment also uh, typically runs less money. So a single unit, uh, we have one particular brand that you can open a center for around 50,000 US dollars. Um, so here in a chart, I have between that and upwards of about 200. Some cases, it might be a little bit more than that. But normally, a center, whether it's English or math, 
even kindergartens or other types of training usually don't cost you more than that to open up a single unit. So that's obviously a much more attractive financial model that uh, should appeal to us. So in summary, just to recap of the, the challenges, um, you know, we really believe that in Asia, uh, the most attractive education franchises are going to be uh, education focused on children, then teens, then adults in that order. And in your types of different franchising, uh, English obviously will remain number one, uh, math and other, other languages, uh, followed by STEM education and professional skills also sort of in that order. And to overcome the challenges, you can do it by asking the right questions of the brand. Make sure you really understand uh, what you're going to get from a franchisor. Do a market entry study or hire somebody to do it so that your strategic vision is very clear uh, and therefore easily achieved. <clears throat> and bottom line, education franchises can be some of the most successful and profitable of any industry. And they also work in almost every single market, especially in ASEAN or in, in Asia in general. So now we're gonna spend our last uh, 15 minutes basically reviewing some of the great education franchises that are, are available in our region. I am gonna move through them very quickly because our seminar really is was about why you should pick educational franchising as an industry. So please contact us after the webinar if you're interested in discussing any of them in more detail. Uh, we would be happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call uh, with you uh, for a follow-up. So let's look at our brands. We're gonna start with Helen Duran. So this is an absolutely fantastic brand. It's successful in 38 countries with more than 1,100 units. I mean, it's a huge company. They focus on quite a, a wide range. Uh, so age three months up to 19 years. So you have a very wide target market. But what really shines uh, with Helen Duran is their effective methodology. They have a, a strong dedication to providing quality education. They don't cut corners anywhere. So this innovative brand has a very comprehensive uh, tools for the franchisee, for the teachers, for the students. They focus on uh, small groups. They use a lot of games and music. And they do one of the industry best jobs of making students really want to come to class by making learning uh, effective, but also very fun. And in their long history, they're well recognized around the, the world for doing just a, a fabulous job. So in 2019, the Helen Duran brand won the best children's franchise, and they also won the best education franchise. So that's absolute incredible testament to this brand. And in 2020, they won the Global Mentorship Award. Um, so they're obviously a very helpful brand. They support their franchisees very well. Uh, and they just do a generally good job. You can't go wrong in choosing any one of the Helen Duran products uh, for your market. So English is the first one. Uh, they also have kindergarten. So they're one of the few franchisors that uh, offer kindergarten programs. And really it has one of the best academic packages in children's education. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it before. Uh, they offer a flexible curriculum. They have uh, amazing tools, apps, videos, songs. And of course they take, they incorporate all of that history, all of that experience from the Helen Duran English and math programs that they've been doing for some time. They've got kindergartens open already in multiple countries. 
uh, from very small formats uh, to quite large ones. And we already have a lot of interest around the region in this relatively new franchising sector. Uh, they provide a full package, great training. And again, they do a lot of things just well, in, incorporating uh, music, yoga, dance, healthy eating. Uh, so every single step of the day uh, for the children at one of their kindergartens has been planned out to the very best uh, that you could possibly expect. Now, Helen Duran, uh, their final product, they also have uh, math writers. So this is a good option where maybe in countries or cities where English is already widely spoken, uh, maybe Manila or Singapore, or whether there's, if there's real strong competition and you wanna do something other than, uh, that other people are not doing, normally math is so important for students and yet, the and so the demand is much higher than the supply. So that leaves a lot of room for math writers to enter a market. And one of the nice things is that the math writers program uh, can even work in rural areas because it can be taught in the local language. So if you're in an area where hiring and finding, keeping English speaking staff is a problem, uh, math writers can be a very good option because everything can be taught in your local language. It's also great for Asia because countries here are very, very test-based. And so the math writers can really help students score higher results in appropriate subjects on their tests. And that's obviously of great interest to the parents. So it focuses between age two and 19. And it enjoys all the same advantages um, that the other Helen Duran uh, brands uh, have that we've already discussed. So Wall Street English. I suspect that almost everybody on this call uh, knows this brand. It's one of the most well-known centers in ASEAN. They have a 44-year history. It's very well established, so you get instant recognition from the public. And they have that very premium lifestyle image, that reputation. People want other people to know that they're uh, studying at Wall Street English. And that's important because unlike our other brands, the focus of Wall Street is on adults. So they don't try to do everything. They don't try to be everything to everyone. They focus on adult learning and they do a great job at it. So there's also like math, there's often an unmet demand for adult or business English learning, and Wall Street does a great job at filling that demand. And they have a blended, blended learning platform that has proven results, uh, great support with digital books, apps, uh, digital lessons. They have a great online community for teacher and student interaction. They do small group engagements in their centers with the teachers for students to practice. They run social clubs for larger group conversations in a, in a more relaxed and common social atmosphere. And uh, pre-coronavirus, uh, they had already been preparing and have now launched a full digital classroom platform. So centers and students have the option it's 100% online, 100% classroom, or their normal blended mix of the two. So well, well established around our region already. It therefore is only available for certain markets. So they're looking for master franchisees in Taiwan, in Cambodia, and Laos. They also have some territory available in Japan, uh, the Philippines and India. So if you're in one of those markets, <clears throat> uh, please consider Wall Street English. They do also have some sub franchising opportunities in countries where they already have Wall Street Englishes. So if you're in a country in maybe a tier two or three cities where there isn't any centers, 
there may be an opportunity and you can contact us uh, about that as well. Next, we have QCO. So QCO is a, a new player in our region and it's quite unique in the fact that you can learn both Mandarin and English uh, with this program. So there, this Mandarin education, as I mentioned earlier, is getting more and more important as the Chinese market uh, expands, as there's more Chinese tourists, as more business is being done with Mandarin speaking countries. It's also 99% digital. So this opens up a whole unique market of people who don't want or don't have time to go to a school a few times a week. So they have great results in speaking and listening skills. There's no classrooms, there's no teachers, which means you can build smaller centers. You have much lower overheads. This uh, no need for expat teachers. You just have local coaches that are bilingual. So it reduces your operating expenses and it also standardizes, standardizes the teaching. So the results in the students are not dependent on the quality of the teacher, either for good or bad. The, the system actually does the teaching and you get more consistent results within the students. So they almost had no impact from uh, the latest uh, COV-19 crisis because the students only need to go uh, to the centers once per week anyway for a one-on-one -on -one session with the coach. So it was very easy to move that to a video call once a week. And so they were very resistant to the crisis that happened recently. Obviously their centers were closed for re new recruitment, but their language teaching for all of their students continued um, uninterrupted, which was very unique among uh, almost all the education brands in the world. They do allow for smaller territories so there's a very low cost investment to get started. So this is a perfect option for entrepreneurs or smaller groups. And last but not least, uh, Scholastic World of English. Now, this is also an, a brand that doesn't need any introduction. If you're involved in education at all, or even if you're just a parent, you already know this brand because of their books. So as the largest children's publisher in the entire world, it's a well-known brand in every market. It's all, their books are already used in many local schools. And they also have a very unique system that does not require expat teachers. They do use teachers, but you can use local uh, bilingual teachers this reduces the cost of hiring. It reduces the monthly salary. But even more importantly, uh, like QCO, it does away with the inconsistent teaching. So it maintains a very high level of academic quality. They do mix classroom and technology. One of the most interesting things about their centers is the library. They always have a huge book library which makes a, a positive statement in the local market about reading and the importance of reading. Uh, it also provides an extra revenue stream out of book sales. So this is a company that has picked a focus and does it well. So they're focused on a very small age group, which is age three to eight. They are expanding to uh, a couple years older than that. Uh, but by focusing on just these few years, uh, they've chosen something and they do it well. So everything from the classroom design, the teacher training, the props, the apps, they're very specifically targeted to this small age group. Now it also is in the area already. Um, so it's only available in a few markets. So they're looking for franchisees in Cambodia Myanmar, Laos, and the Philippines. So if you're in one of those markets, you have an opportunity um, to go with Scholastic World of English. So thank you very much for listening to my long talk. Uh, I hope that uh, it was informative uh, to some of you, answered a few questions, gave you a little bit of a unique insight on why you might wanna consider 
uh, an education franchise. Um, it is has huge potential in our market, in our region. So I think that uh, the numbers and the brands look very attractive. Uh, and now I'll turn it back over to Sean, our MC. Thank you very much, Robert. Giving a lot of uh, useful information about today's topic. Uh, as you mentioned, um, there are a lot of people who have joined us online, so we thank you for your participation, not only in ASEAN or, or Southeast Asia, but we have people throughout Asia Pacific, uh, as well as uh, many countries in South Asia, including India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, etc., and as far away as North Africa, which is a very nice, pleasant uh, surprise. So now it is time for our Q&A session. Please remember you can ask Robert your questions by typing them into your device. Uh, you may type them into the box at the bottom right-hand corner of your device. Please be sure to end your question with a question mark so that it will appear in the list of questions for the speaker to address. And now we, it looks like we have quite a few questions already, so let's begin. So thanks, Sean. We'll go through these questions as much as we have time for. Uh, Thomas asks, what customer segment is best? Children, teenagers, adults? So this is a good question, Thomas, uh, and we did, I did mention it. Uh, most countries, most uh, families are willing to spend money uh, primarily on their children. So we found that children's uh, education, regardless of whether it's English or math or some other skill, uh, is the easiest for recruitment purposes, followed by teenagers and then adults in that order. Now, that doesn't mean that you should only look for children's franchises, though, um, because oftentimes, especially the adult segment, isn't uh, fulfilling the market demand where you live. There may not be any language centers focused on serving adults, which means that you could be unique in your market by going with the adult education. But in general, the list is children, teenagers, and then adults. So Sam asks, how are learning centers doing during COVID-19 and how are they adapting? So I wanted to pick this one as one of the first because it's out. Uh, this is on everybody's mind, both on franchisors, on existing franchisees, and on new potential investors uh, like yourselves. So this obviously has had an impact like nothing else we've ever seen before in the industry. And it required a lot of work and, and fast work on the part of franchisors and franchisees everywhere. And most of the franchisors, I'm happy to say, um, did a fairly good job. So over the past few years, uh, digital uh, aspects, online aspects have, becoming, be, have been becoming more popular and more well used, more accepted by the public. And so those things obviously could continue. For sure, the centers themselves were closed in many markets for quite a period of time. Uh, they're just starting to reopen uh, in Vietnam and, and several other countries. We're expecting them to reopen in the rest of the region very shortly. So there was an impact for sure. However, some brands specifically that uh, could go 100% online, of which we have two, um, they were less affected, but we don't really expect things like COVID-19 to repeat very often. And it's true that most people still prefer to go into a physical center, um, just like going to the gym is motivates you to do it more than just doing workout at home. So regardless of the type of education, uh, that the brand that you're looking at has, uh, we expect it to be quite strong, but they've all adapted. For sure, hygiene and safety in all centers is going to be a much higher priority for sure moving forward as well. So Eric asks a good question. What type of education is popular and in demand in Asia? English, Mandarin, math. So Eric, the answer to this one is all of them. 
Um, English is the number one category in education franchising. It's number one around the world. It's number one in Asia. Um, so it's a uh, high potential for success, no matter what brand you choose. Um, English education is not going to go away. Uh, math, Mandarin, uh, other types of education are available. Sometimes they have less competition in various markets, so they're worth considering as well. Really, as long as you pick the right brand, as long as you look at the market carefully, uh, the answer to this question is going to vary market by market. And if you discuss with us offline your particular market, um, we can help you make a better choice that's uh, more applicable to you. Now, Anne asks, how do I apply as an education franchisor? So, uh, Anne, if you have a, an education system, maybe you have a language center or some other uh, type of educational product, and you want to become a franchisor, uh, I would, we would be happy to speak with you on a one-on-one -on -one session uh, about this. We've helped many brands, uh, including many in education, take their concept. Uh, maybe they are successful in three or four outlets. Uh, we can help them put together a franchise package, everything from uh, franchise agreements and the legal documents to an operations manual, everything that you need to become a franchisor. And obviously, we also do business development, so we can help find qualified franchisees uh, throughout your country and also internationally if appropriate. Okay, Tika asks, how will you be supporting choosing the brand partner, assessing the competitors, choosing the right location and the investment required for it? Okay, well, thank you for this question. Uh, it's a good one. So our job as franchise consultants really is to pre-qualify brands that we think will work in the market. So the ones that I've shown you are just a five out of hundreds that are available, but are ones that we think have very high potential in our region. So that's kind of step number one. When speaking with you one-on-one, -on -one, on a separate call, uh, finding out exactly uh, where you are, uh, what kind of business plan you have, what you want to achieve. We can help you narrow that down to just one brand partner. We can also do market entry studies where we can look at the market, uh, evaluate the competitors, really give you the information that you need to both choose the right brand partner, but also to launch that brand in your local market. Now, choosing the right location um, is normally uh, a joint effort between yourself, who's going to know the market the best, and the franchisor, which knows what their brand needs uh, at, and what the right location is for their brand. So you'll get support from the franchisor about choosing the right location. And then on the investment, I, we can also share that with you. So once we discuss with you what territory you're looking at uh, and what brand you're looking at, we can give you the fees and the investment that's required uh, to launch in your particular territory. Now, Gloria asks a similar question. Uh, can uh, VF Franchising uh, help me to determine the best franchise to choose from? Uh, I think we've kind of covered that already. That is part of our job. Uh, we represent uh, various brands and, and we represent several because each brand is not the right choice for every single investor. So on a separate calls, we can help you to determine which one would be best for your situation. Thomas asks, should I choose normal learning center franchise or go with digital solution? So I've also kind of mentioned this before, Thomas, but it's a good question. Um, learning centers are easier to recruit students. They are, they, they're a physical presence that is visible. It's in front of the public. It reminds people that you're there, it gets your brand out there. And people still feel like when they go there, they go with a purpose. 
And so when you've made the effort to travel there, the, the students are focused and that's why they can be effective. Now you'll find that most uh, learning centers now have digital components. It is possible to do a lot of extra activities, extra lessons, extra reading, listening practice on various apps uh, and other tools that are provided. Uh, so even learning centers uh, are moving to the digital age, which is a great thing. So you can get the best of both worlds. Now, each one of our brands uh, is somewhere on the scale between 100% physical or 100% digital. So what is exactly right for your company, uh, for your market, uh, we, we have the flexibility to find you the right solution. Now, Thomas also asked, how much money do I need to open a learning center? So this is also gonna vary uh, brand by brand and market by market. So opening anything in Singapore is obviously gonna cost less than opening it in Laos. Um, just because of building and land costs and such things are, are varied. But brand by brand, it also varies. So some of our brands like Cuco have very small centers because they don't have traditional classrooms. So you can open those for as little as 50,000 US dollars in a lot of markets. Other schools, uh, maybe when you're talking about a Helen Duran kindergarten, maybe a larger one, obviously that's going to be a much larger investment. Uh, but obviously the revenue generated is also going to be uh, proportionately larger as well. So again, that's something that we can discuss uh, once we know your particular market. So Sam asks, what are the franchise fees and royalties fees for Helen Duran Kindergarten? So we didn't discuss that in this uh, presentation. Again, this was a little bit more about the industry in general. Uh, franchise fees vary uh, brand to brand, and I don't really wanna talk about any particular brand. We can, uh, I can answer that question for you on a one-on-one -on -one a call or additional email. But in general, uh, all brands have some sort of upfront fees, which might be as low as about $25,000. And it can be right up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars if it's uh, a large territory that you're looking for exclusivity in. Royalty fees tend to range between uh, 6% and 14%, again, depending on the brand but that's general, the, the range. Do we share the presentation file? So uh, good question. We will send you the presentation uh, for everybody who attended this uh, set webinar. Uh, it will be in Adobe Acrobat format, of course, uh, but you'll be able to review the information uh, at your leisure. And again, please feel free to contact us with any questions that we didn't uh, cover. Quite a few people who attended from Bangladesh. Uh, is it possible training and development field? How do I communicate with you and in, to introduce training franchise? So please uh, contact us directly. Uh, our email, we will be contacting everybody by email and I can address that question uh, directly with you later. Thomas asks, I have an education business that is not a franchise. Can you help make it a franchise? The answer is yes. Uh, we've covered that a little bit already, but that's one of the services that VF Franchise Consulting uh, does do. Final question, uh, Gloria asks, what are the critical success factors for an education franchise? Well, obviously any new business, um, you want to be profitable. You want to uh, bring a new brand uh, that, it, that you can be proud of to an, an industry. And I think that you can be successful when you get uh, profitable units, when you can make a difference in people's lives, because we're talking about the education industry. We want to make sure that we're teaching, uh, effectively teaching students, regardless of what the subject is, regardless of what the age group is, something new. And I think we have the opportunity to do that, especially in the Asian market. So thank you for joining us again. Thank you for your questions. I know we didn't get to all of your questions, um, but there was a lot. But please, please contact us uh, afterward. Happy to answer any additional questions or discuss with you uh, 
um, any of our brands at a later time. We would like to thank everyone for attending, especially our speaker, Robert. A uh, final reminder that uh, VIA Franchise Consulting offers a wide variety of franchises in education, food and beverage, services, retail. We regularly run franchise business matching events and webinars to share information to prospective franchisees and investors. Please visit our website for more information about us at vffranchiseconsulting.com. Or if you have any questions about any of our franchises or uh, this particular topic webinar, please email us at info at vffranchiseconsulting.com. Please note, we also assist many clients who wish to make their businesses franchisable. Uh, as we saw in the Q&A forum, there were quite a number of uh, questions related to that. Uh, we're very happy to see that. Uh, and certainly, if we were not able to get to you uh, during the Q&A session, please do contact us and we will set up a one-on-one -on -one call to learn more about your business and whether uh, there is an opportunity to assist you uh, in successfully uh, building your business into a franchise. And finally, keep an eye out for our email in the next couple of days. Thank you, stay safe, and have a great day. Bye-bye.